Oh, you. you. <laughs> there you go. Good evening and welcome to the Co-Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist. I'm delighted to see you all here in person tonight and we welcome everyone who joins us on the live stream for the third session of our reflections on Lent and the events of Easter through art. Uh, please remember to use the microphone when the time comes for us to explore our paintings tonight and Amelia will help us uh, facilitating the micro microphone again. This familiar slide is updated to orientate tonight's pictures in the European artistic eras. Our first painting of the evening, the Sacrament of the Last Supper, created by Salvador Dali in 1955. The Sacrament of the Last Supper is not an attempt to recreate the actual historical event of the Supper, but rather a symbolic representation of the Eucharistic ritual. In our second painting, Christ after the flagellation contemplated by the Christian soul, painted by Diego Velasquez, during the Baroque period, sometime between 1628 and 1629, we are encouraged to reflect on the suffering of Christ in the period between his sentence and crucifixion. In our last painting, Ecce Homo, the Latin words for behold the man, Painted in 1891, Antonio Cesare places us, the viewer, in the company of Pontius Pilate at the same time as Christ receives his death sentence. Before we begin to explore this evening's three paintings, I will take a few minutes to touch upon the close connection between the early expansion of Christianity and the development of the arts. These two entities, Christianity and art, have been intertwined since the early days of the church. At the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, Judea was part of the Roman Empire. As you can see here on the map, the Roman Empire is delineated in red, and Judea is over here. 
and Judea was ruled by the Roman Empire Tiberius. The earliest Christian communities emerged in that region of Judea. Subsequently, Christianity spread initially sporadically in small pockets around the Mediterranean Sea. You can see that here in the, on the map, the darker areas are the first communities that sprang, that um, are Christian communities. By the beginning of the fourth century, Christianity had expanded throughout the Roman Empire. And again, we can see this here in the lighter orange. It had spread through the entire Roman Empire. How did this expansion of Christianity happen? There are, of course, a multitude of reasons, and I will only touch on a few of them. Most importantly, the early Christians' unwavering dedication and commitment to their mission, despite persecution and resistance, laid the foundation for the growth and expansion of Christianity across Europe. In the first and second century, St. Paul and others preached that not just Jews, but also all the Gentiles should receive the Christian message. It also helped that the authors of the Christian gospel wrote them in Koine Greek, a common version of the Greek language, making the gospel accessible to educated people all over the empire. Practically speaking, the spread of Christianity was greatly aided by the empire's political unification and its extensive sea lanes and road systems, which the Romans are particularly famous for. The disciples and apostles, like St. Paul, were actually able to travel throughout the empire to spread Christianity. It has been suggested that St. Paul traveled more than 10,000 miles zigzagging through the Roman Empire and that mostly on foot. However, the truly pivotal factor in the expansion of Christianity and subsequently art was the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine I, also known as Constantine the Great through the immediation of his mother, Helena. In 312 AD, Constantine fought the famous battle of the Milvian Bridge outside of Rome. The night before the battle, Christ had appeared to Constantine in a dream, ordering to place a heavenly divine symbol on his soldiers, shields, and helmets. It was probably the Kai Rho symbol that was used, and we see it over here. Kai Rho is the superimposing of the first two capital letters of the Greek word Christos, in such way that the vertical stroke of the Rho intersects with the center of the Chai as shown on the slide. And subsequently, the symbol was also used on coins that were minted throughout the Roman Empire. And this one, this coin was struck in 326 AD. And over here you can see that they had the Chi and Rho symbol on the shields. Constantine won the battle and became the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. As such, he legalized Christianity in the Roman Empire by the Edict of Milan in 313 AD. He also convened the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, where Christianity was solidated into what would become the state religion in 380 AD.
the earliest surviving Christian artworks are painted frescoes on the walls of the catacombs and meeting houses at the time of Christian persecution in the Roman Empire. As we can see here on the slide, Christ is depicted as the Good Shepherd. And there's also an image of the Virgin Mary with the Christ child, which were created in the second and the early fourth century, respectively. The legalization of Christianity with the Edict of Milan and the later establishment of Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire transformed art, which progressively adopt richer forms such as mosaics and illuminated manuscripts, eventually flowering into Christian art as we know it today. In 599 AD, Pope and Saint Gregory the Great, in a letter to Serranus, Bishop of Marseille, expressed explicitly the importance of paintings and representing biblical narratives, parables, and symbols. This recognition of the value of art to the mission of the church continued and grew throughout centuries to the present time. Therefore, we are blessed with our abundance of all the Christian art in all its forms, as we see it today. With these introductory comments, I would now like to turn over to our first work of art of the evening. Our first painting is the Sacrament of the Last Supper, painted in 1955 by the Spanish artist Salvador Dali. As I introduce the artist, you can follow along on the handout. Salvador Dali was born in 1904 and died in 1989 in Figueres, Spain. He was one of the most avant-garde, bizarre, and celebrated artists of the 20th century. His fiercely technical, yet highly unusual paintings, sculptures, and visual explorations in film and life-size interactive art ushered in a new generation of imaginative expression. Dali is particularly well known for his surrealist art in which he was influenced by exploration of the subconscious imagery prompted by writings from Sigmund Freud and his affiliation to the Surrealist movement in Paris in the early 1920s. During 1929 to 1937, his painting style matured with extraordinary rapidity, and he depicted a dream world in which commonplace objects are juxtaposed, deformed, or otherwise metamorphosed in a bizarre, irrational fashion. Perhaps his most famous of these enigmatic images is The Persistence of Memory, painted in 1931, in which limp-melting watches rest in an eerily calm landscape. And I should have brought a picture, but I think everyone is quite familiar with that one. In the late 1930s, however, Dali switched to painting in a more academic style, influenced by the Renaissance painter Raphael. He created 19 large canvases characterized by meticulously detailed images of religious, historical, and scientific themes, or what Dali called nuclear mysticism. He became obsessed with geometry, DNA, divinity, ex and experimented heavily with visual illusions. From a personal perspective, his growing affinity for religious themes prompted him and Gala, his muse and the love of his life, to remarry, this time in a Catholic church. However, he never 
really gave up his eccentric lifestyle and all the facets that come with a lifestyle like that. As you consider our first work of art of the evening, I will quote from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 22, verses 19 and 20. I quote, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. End of quote. And I see Emilia got, has gotten ready with her microphone because now I would like to invite you um, for any comments, any thoughts. Um, this painting is located at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Again, maybe someone has seen it. What was your impression? Um, Do we see someone's influence in this painting? No, something? Um, let's, <laughs> okay, Amelia. I think it's kind of interesting that how on the bottom, the people who are kneeling, their robes are see-through. Yep. Yeah. Kind of this translucence, yeah, very nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the entire painting just gives a well, Salvador Dali, <laughs> what can I say? But the feeling that that entire painting gives is one of something very special and Christ is the center of it, and we know what, what was happening then. And he, he, are those two, like, is that bread on the, uh, in the yeah? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I see so the we wine. Can, we can, yeah, yeah, I zoomed into this, we can actually, there you go. Yep, so the bread yeah. has been broken already. Uh -huh. and, and it's just that the specialness of what's happening is infused in the entire painting. I, r I really I get a really good feeling looking at it. <laughs> yes. For me, the, the thing that strikes is it seems to have this sort of a timeless quality. It's like it, there's a participation of, of Christ at, at the Last Supper, the, at that event, but then there are these sort of monastic looking people that are in adoration at but participating in the event and um, and then this superstructure of the windows and the distance and time and how the whatever the structure is is transparent it, it, and time and space don't exist or they it all exists at once you know that that, mm -hmm. that sense that we have in the mass that this is a participation in the actual Last Supper in the non-bloody sacrifice that Christ made for us. So. Yes, beautiful. I'm looking at the uh, wine glass, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing a long image in front of it, or, or like there's a light source right at Christ coming across. In it. Something like it, it. Yeah. So that, you know, it makes a long shadow instead of coming from outside in general where there is some light. Okay. And I'm not quite sure the building we've got there, when it gets close to the earth, kind of fades. You know. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. So I. S I guess I see some futuristic things about it, like almost the geodesic dome, the 
like sort of futuristic parts of the structure. So I always struggle with Dolly. But um, so some of it looks sort of it's in the future and some of it's obviously the past and maybe it's talking about different times. And mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and the, the painting um, resonated with many people, but he also got a lot of criticism for it. Uh, but I think all the comments we have heard so far are beautiful. Exactly, it's starting with the timelessness of it. And very much, I think Dali was trying to express that s because he wasn't taking us back 2,000 years ago, he wanted to show this happens every week or every day in Mass. We celebrate and we participate in the Eucharist. Um, and I think, th so he, he loved geometry. He was very fascinated by it. And he, he, was, um, he, he was very much into math. He was into the golden rule. Um, he, and that would is his um, fascination in the nuclear uh, mysticism that he called, he actually, which very much thought that science and math and religion worked together. So he wasn't, today we, we get a feeling sometimes or people would say that science and religion don't work together, but he, he believed in that. Um, that was part of the core idea of um, his nuclear mysticism, that rel um, science and geometry, and so we see works together, it's very close actually together. So the structure, these are um, pentagons, and it's a 12-sided structure made out of pentagons. So, um, it's very, very orderly. So it's a very orderly arrangement and a p specific placement of all the elements within the painting. What we have seen here also, it's this change between the solidness and something we can touch, but also the transcendental nature of Christ and what we believe in. So that's why the beams kind of dissolve into nothingness. And then also the scene is set into um, a, sea, a seashore setting. And this is actually, uh, Dali could see this when he was looking out of his um, window and at his home. He, uh, he lived in Catalonia, so that's kind of the area that he, where he lived. And he liked to include um, that environment into some of his paintings. Because if we remember last year in the Lenten series, we um, talked about his, the other painting, um, it was uh, Christ of St. John of the Cross. Um, and then we also had uh, the landscape, the, his Catalonian landscape in the background. Yeah, um, so let's, and then, so yeah, we, we pointed out uh, the bread and the wine, and just so you, a couple of, again, geometry was very, very important. So Christ, is the, his head is the dead center of the painting. If you would draw cross lines across the painting, his face is the, is the center. Uh, but also, he, there's a lot of triangles in it. So Christ forms a triangle himself. He forms a triangle with, with the bread. Um, so, again, geometry always pulls into his thinking and how he lays out uh, his paintings. And Amelia pointed out the disciples in what um, Michael, so again, it's not the disciples, it is 12 disciples, because the, num the number 12 was very important to Dali. It's, there's uh, 12 months in the year, there were 12 disciples, there's two times 12 hours in a day, so he liked that anyway. Uh, and the, it's actually a mirror image, so there are not 12 individuals, it's actually, it's a perfect um, mirror image. 
So they are the same and as you would look at the, the hands and how they, they're folded, there's the same. However, there's one special one in here. <laughs> A special one. Um, he's he's not wearing white. He's wearing a yellow. To he's probably singling out who, whom, who who is he singling out? Judas. Judas. Yeah. Or all the other sinners that we are and walking <laughs> around on <laughs> on Mother Earth. So. <laughs> And the image on top? Yes. Mm, it's open to debate, again, I would say. Um, any, any suggestions? I mean. I was kind of wondering if it's like a duplication, <laughs> a duplication, a presence that is there, meaning Christ. Obviously, you could think of the Father, but it, it doesn't seem so much to portray the father. Mm -hmm. And for, um, obviously in Stali was contemporary, we have some of his explanations and his thoughts on this painting. I didn't find anything that he specifically expressed who, if he wanted to express, uh, depict Christ or, or God the father. Uh, so I think that is open for interpretation. Um, it could be Christ. Some people argue, well, you, um, you don't see his marks in the hands. Um, however, he painted in an interesting way so that the thumb could actually hide the marks of the hands. So it could still be um, the resurrected Christ. Uh, but it also could be God um, as kind of the Trinity. Um, so yeah, this is, I think, either either or. What I thought was very really interesting, and when, so it was always one who had to be careful in art when, de when we were de depicting Christ and God, because it was to be careful not to, um, celebrate necessarily the image itself, but God itself or Christ itself. So there was, at the beginning of Christianity, there was that tension, uh, and, and Judaism very much believes in that, that we should not have depictions of Christ. And I think that has overcome because it, it is felt that having a picture of Christ that we can, can pray to actually helps us uh, celebrate our, our, our beliefs. Um, but I think Dali was a little bit, he didn't, if he wanted to depict God, he, he chose not to, to, chose, uh, to depict the face. There's another p painting by Dali where th there is the presence of God, but actually God, ha he holds his hands over his face, and again, we can't see the face. So I think he was playing with that if we would think it was um, God the Father. Yeah. Any? Well, somehow it makes me think of the Transfiguration. Uh, you know that at the time of the consecration, t the time of the Last Supper. Uh, uh, I mean, this is Dolly's uh, vision of what it might look like if it, if this if the scene were transfigured. Okay. Uh, and in which case you could explain that top image as being God the Father. Um, I don't know, just the translucency of it, and the, it just looks like it's, uh, uh, they've been transfigured before them. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So you said this is uh, up to interpretation. So this is kind of a, the way I weirdly, if you say, uh, see it, is there's this altar in this building. Christ 
is above and he's sending his body and the disciples down because when you look at Christ you can actually see the boat through mm -hmm. him you can actually see the lights as the gentleman said earlier the lights coming through him and the glass is projecting a shadow so it's like Christ is above um, descending upon this altar for a communion for the Eucharist and sending himself and the disciples down onto it where um, you know the sea is in the background and because they're there it makes it see-through mm -hmm. yes that would, yeah beautiful I think that's very much yeah I, I think the figure uh, up top with the extended hands is Christ um, and it's a resurrection uh, because uh, this is my body which I give up for you and he's pointing up there and I think uh, the fact that he uh, becomes uh, invisible if you want from the chest down uh, signifies the resurrection to me the other thing that we were discussing is that the wine and the bread and the altar are very solid and all the rest of it is sort of ephemeral and so I mean I think that's nice as symbolism for the the weekly mass that we have that's solid and represents and is what we see here so yeah Yes, wonderful. I think we heard wonderful interpretations and your thoughts um, on this painting. And it is a very striking and quite a different work of art. And this painting is today one of the most popular works in National Gallery in Washington, DC. And it represents the perfect synthesis of Dali's interest in the intersection of science and mathematics with the subconscious mind offering proof for the existence of God. Those were thoughts of Dali. So with this now, I would like to leave you with the question, am I following Christ's invitation to participate in his holy sacrifice? And now it's time for us to move on to our second work of art of this evening. It is the painting, Christ After the Flagellation, contemplated by the Christian soul by Diego Velazquez, painted probably between 1628 and 1629. Velazquez shows an interpretation of the moment of Christ's flagellation that has rarely been depicted in art. And again, you can follow on the handout. Diego Velazquez was born in 1599 in Seville in southern Spain. At the time, Seville was an important city with a thriving artistic community. At the age of 11, Velazquez was apprenticed to Francesco Pacchio, Seville's most significant artist and art historian. During his early years in Seville, Velazquez produced traditional religious works such as the Immaculate Conception, St. John the Evangelist on Patmos, and paintings of everyday life or tavern scenes. Occasionally, and more unusually, he combined the two. And there is an example of that in this painting. Um, it's titled, Christ in the House of Martha and Mary, and it was painted in 1618. Velasquez painted an everyday kitchen scene, but in the back there is a, a door open or a latch or a window, and we can see that Christ is visiting with Mary. And so he kind of liked doing this. There's a couple of his works that have done the combination of, of everyday scenes bringing in um, a scene of the, the, a biblical scene. 
1623, King Philip IV appointed Velasquez as one of his court painters. Velasquez always maintained a close relationship with the king and his family. In his most famous work, Las Meninas, The Maids of Honor, he shows himself at work in the court. And then in 1658, two years before his death, Velasquez was made a king of Santiago. Tonight's painting was probably made between 1628, 1629, just before Velasquez's first trip to Italy in 1629 and 1630. But there's some uncertainty. It also has sometimes has been dated uh, to the time while he was in Italy and to the period immediately following, once he had returned to Madrid. The fact that the painting is on a reddish brown background um, is typical for Velasquez before his trip to Italy and it suggested the date before 1629. In 1660, at the age of 61, Velasquez fell ill and died, followed by his wife just a week later. For this painting, I will not quote from a gospel reading, but I will read out an inscription which was placed on a painting with a sim similar composition. Also, take pity on me, for you have reduced me to this state." End of quote. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a rather unusual depiction of the flagellation. Uh, very often, we see the flagellation as it happens, the soldiers using the whips, uh, or another um, way of the flagellation was depicted was right after the soldiers had left and Christ is in isolation. Uh, but um, this is rather unusual. And I would like to ask you um, if you would like to, to comment. Um, again, there's a lot of geometry in it, um, so maybe that can help you to pick things apart. Um, and just so, you so this is the Christian soul in depicted as a young child. And this is uh, the, um, an angel, and he's kind of leading on the Christian soul to, to look at Christ's suffering. Yeah, Amelia. I think it's interesting the way the Christian soul is looking at Jesus. Like it's half sad and half almost confused, kind of. Yeah, that's beautiful. Anyone else? Well, I, my first thought is for a Spanish painter, this is a very unbloody depiction of the passion. <laughs> the Spanish really emphasize that a lot. Um, then y your little blue line there is kind of covering it up, but there's this okay. little ray okay. that's going out yep. of Christ to the, to the compassionate Christian. Yep. The person who's experiencing compassion with Christ and his... Yeah, so kind of a connection because oh, yeah, exactly. So this this ray of light hits um, the Christian soul, the right kind of in his heart or on his uh, in his clasped hands. Yeah, so that's a beautiful detail. Yeah, and I kind of also. Um, so this is right after the flagellation. As Michael said, it's Velasquez wasn't going for the shock. He, he, he didn't want to present a lot of blood. Um, 
Christ, there's just a couple of sprinkles of blood on his leg down here. We don't see um, much on his back or anything. Um, but it's, it's clearly Christ is exhausted. He's falling back. This, the cords are, are tight, they're tucked. Um, and he's h- hard time looking at, at the, the Christian soul. Uh, he's, but he's turning, and then I just kind of put the blue line again, just really specifically, Valeskis placed the child in a position that it m- so beautifully meets his clasped hand or kind of um, meets his heart. Um, and then our Christ is uh, in the perfect center of the painting. And just, we could have drawn many lines. Um, also his legs, um, if we would have drawn lines in, as extension of the legs, they also would meet the heart of the Christian soul. So everything, Christ radiates all his, everything of his to the Christ child and asked for his compassion and contemplation. Thank you, Amelia. Um, I found really interesting um, that there is a clear light source for Jesus on this one. Um, That light source is coming from his right side. You can tell by the shadow on the left side of his face. But then on the angel and the child, the light source seems like it's coming from him. Because that same side that is dark on Jesus is not dark on their side, if you you see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So... There's a light source that's shining on Jesus, and then there's a there, there's a light source that's coming from Jesus. It seems like, in the way that the the artist used kind of light to enhance, I guess, Christ in this sense, even in his yes. punishment, if you if you will. Yeah. Yeah. So we're coming back a little bit to our um, tenebrism and the use of uh, Kiros Kuro, uh, kind of to model uh, Christ. All I was going to say is it, it shows his complete isolation and loneliness. He's totally alone, and he doesn't seem to be, he, he, um, he isn't affected by those around him, but he ha- you, he's showing you he's alone and how, how stressful it must have been because he was isolated after that. He was in a pit after um, the fa- flagellation, and he was alone that night, and so you see how alone he is and how desperate he is, so. Um, I think the angel should remind us all that we we all have an angel (laughs) entrusted to us. Yeah, our personal guardian angel, isn't it? Yes. Um, exactly, so um, Brian beautifully pointed out the light and the different light sources and we have a tenebrism, as we said, so tenebrism means really murkiness, darkness in the background. So again, it sets it, makes it again somewhat timeless um, and it's not pinpointed to a p- specific place and moment in time. And we have chiaroscuro, which means using light and shadow to beautifully model Christ, particularly, I think, Christ's um, body. I mean, it's so three-dimensional. Again, we, we see beautiful uh, the, way the muscle um, on his body and the, and the flesh. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and it's, it's such a, I could only find one other work of art where we have kind of this combination of Christ being isolated after the fact, after the um, flagellation without the soldiers and in the, in the company of a, of a guardian angel. And then I think this is such a beautiful addition f- to bring us into the painting and, and, and really make us think it through and, and 
participate in his suffering um, that he has gone through, through all the steps. I mean, we sometimes, I don't know, we, we sometimes jump on all the way to the end, and it's the suffering when he dies, but it was a, a long stretch, and it was a long time, the uh, 36 hours um, of his suffering. So p to participate in every single step of his suffering. So, um, and I would leave you with the question, can my contemplation of Christ's suffering help me persevere through my own sufferings? And yes, let's move on to our third painting. I would like to end tonight's reflection with our third painting, Ecce Homo, by Antonio Cesari painted over a 20-year period from 1871 to 1891. Antonio Cesari was a Swiss-Italian painter born in 1829 in Ronco, Switzerland. At the age of 12, he went to Florence to study drawing with Ernesto Bonagnuti, and from 1834, he was a pupil at the Academia di Bella Arte. In 1849, he began offering instructions to younger artists and eventually ran a private art school. Among his earliest students was Silvestro Ligion. Cesare's religious paintings are Raffaelesque in their compositional outlines and their polished surfaces, but are almost photographic in effect. His works followed the aesthetic qualities of the romantic and academic art movements. He fulfilled many important commissions for churches in Italy and Switzerland. Cesare was also a prolific portrait artist. He died in Florence in 1891 at the age of 69 leaving behind a legacy of significant religious paintings. Cesare's painting, Ecce Homo, was commissioned by the Italian government in 1871. It represents Cesare's most impressive religious work. It took him 20 years to finish this painting, and it was first exhibited in the artist's studio shortly after his death. The painting won immediate acclaim for its luminosity and superior effect of transparent whites. And it's what I thought quite interesting. He, he painted in the style of Raphael, and it sounds like he died in the way of Raphael, because if we f remember the Transfiguration was one of Raphael's most important paintings, and it was displaced in his workshop uh, just because he had died unexpectedly while he was working on that particular work of art. So, As you consider our third work of art of this evening, I will quote from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. I quote, So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. The end of quote. And so I invite everyone here. So what do you see? What are maybe the colors in particular the artist used? Who's in the center of this painting? And this is, is this a setting that if you think back of having, when you look at pictures at your homo, is that necessarily the way we have seen it many times? I'm just looking at all the people and some of them look like they're willing Yes, let's get this over with. And then there's like Mary, or the woman who's, I'm, I'm not really sure I want this to happen. And 
it's just a lot of different reactions by the people. And of course, the colors that we discussed with the red and the, but that looks red to me, not purple. I know, I was, I think probably the artist was also using the red more for the, the color of passion. Um, although it was a purple rope that the soldiers put around him. You asked, is this the way that the Eche Homa is usually depicted? And it's not because, again, Christ isn't very bloody and, you know, he's not, you don't see that physical suffering as much in this depiction. But I think, this is unusual to me because I think that's Pilate's wife that's turned away. Yep. You know, she said, have nothing to do with this man. You know, she had a, what was a dream, I think, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And um, they, that's almost never included in in this, in, in depictions of, of the scene. The other thing I'm gonna say is, this is just a Latin quirk, but it's always translated as, as behold the man, but really it is behold the person. It's like, look at this person. It, it, to me, that says a lot more than behold the man, because, you know, the man in Latin is vir, and, and homo is person, the human okay. being. Look at this person. It's like, look what, look what you've got this, this state this guy is in. What, what are you thinking, you know, to the crowd? To me, it, it really exonerates Pilate in a way because, you know, he, you, he's like, he's kind of throwing it back at the crowd by saying mm. that. Not, not behold the man, you know. It's oh, not, right. not like he's elevating Christ. He's saying this no. poor guy is is beat to death, what are you thinking, people? You know, mm -hmm. do you want this to go on? You know, and he yeah. said, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The other, the, uh, one of the interesting things to me, obviously, is, is the, it's a background scene. Mm -hmm. It's from the back instead of the front. and. Pilate didn't go out and speak to the, the Jewish crowd or mob or the, uh, the leading Jewish politicians once. He went out on three separate occasions. This was a back and forth deal. And clearly Pilate did not want him crucified. The crowd did. And Pilate on three occasions said, listen, I find no fault with this man. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, as a politician, as a colonial politician, he succumbed to political pressure rather than having the strength and integrity to follow his own belief. Yeah. I, I see two things. One is the, in the distance up on the top, I sense that those are the, the elders, the Pharisees. Uh -huh. They're sort of egging the crowd on, that Pilate is on one side, they're on the other side. And the other thing that I notice is the throne is empty. The chair is empty. There's a decision being made. Where in the other pictures, you know, Christ was kind of in the center, it seems like if you draw exact center, that's where P Pilate's arm is and his coat is starting, and that Christ and Pilate are balanced off that spot, one to the left and one to the right. Mm -hmm. Yes, yep. So I see Pilate working really hard to solve this. And then Christ has just, I think he's, he knows what's happening and he just, he seems very still and, and knows the decision has already been made. But I think, I always am sympathetic to Pilate who I think is really trying hard to make something different happen. And he's working, he's working in the crowd, he's trying hard to make Yes, yep. 
Also, I noticed that there's cheetah fur on the chair, uh, which probably means that Pontius Pilate was really rich, right. and it represents that the Roman Empire was very wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Um, l let's start pulling this all together, exactly. So, um, again, when, when you, we would draw a cross line, um, Pontius Pilate is pretty much the center this time of the painting and not Christ. Uh, he, and this is a very unusual depiction of this scene. Uh, we, many times, the artist chooses to place us, the viewer, within the crowd. And so we're looking up onto Pi Pontius Pilate and onto Christ. So we are actually mingling amongst uh, the Roman um, soldiers and, and Pontius Pilate. And he's, he's depicted in dazzling white. So I think the artist, or there was some notion that it wasn't necessarily, I mean, in throughout the history, I think Pilate has gone through some phases that he was, it was felt that he was guilty of not saving Christ, but then also I think there's a more lenient perspective to his situation uh, that he, he tried hard, as, as Chris said, he went out multiple times, and he was hoping, showing Christ like that, to um, provoke pity in the people, and, and as Michael said, it's like, look at him, he's, I mean, not necessarily in this picture, but I'm sure he, he, he looked terrible, and with all the blood and the open skin after the flagellation, he was trying to evoke pity and trying to change their mind. So um, I think Pilate, Pontius Pilate tried to change the faith uh, of, of Christ. Um, and also because we are standing behind the scene, if you noticed, we can't only we see some of the faces in profile. We don't see any of the faces fully except this one. Uh, and she is believed to be his wife. And in the Gospel of uh, Matthew, there is a, a short reference that she called, when she heard that Pontius Pilate had to deal with the decision, that she um, sent a an, an word to him and say, um, don't have anything to do with this. Uh, I, I had dreamed um, and I had tough, terribly suffered because um, and just stay away from this. And, and I think that's really beautiful. I mean, her face, and we can see that she's um, devastated. Uh, she's actually holding on to probably one of her servants uh, to steady herself. Uh, so I, I think that's a, a beautiful scene. And come back to the throne, I think that it's very interesting that multiple people packed up on this. Uh, Yes, it is. It is empty. So who's, were you maybe thinking who's supposed to be sitting on it? Yes, um, because we would think it should be Christ, our King. Um, the other thing, just something small that I thought it was very interesting, um, this chap, he seems to be maybe kind of second in line to Pontius Pilate, and he seems to be a little bit claiming that chair. Uh, he has his hand on it. Uh, he has his foot on a little pestle, a pedestal. Um, so uh, there's nothing in this in the story, but I thought that was a, a, a quite of an intriguing detail that the painter chose to implement as a showing that there was probably a lot of um, struggle, political struggle going on behind the scenes as well. So it wasn't just that straightforward. Um, yes, uh, so in up here, yeah, I thought that was a, a great detail as well. The Pharisees probably keeping, keep the crowd going, uh, make sure they were um, calling for, for Christ's crucifixion. And I think that was 
Not here? Yeah. Anyone mean? I think this uh, is about 20 years after the unification of Italy. And it's interesting that it was commissioned by the Italian government, which would have been a, a major statement at that time, because Italy was a bunch of city states up until about 1856, if I recall, when Garibaldi uh, began to push for unification. Um, the old symbol of the Roman army uh, is that, uh, that large thing, and I'm blanking on the name of it, um, that is um, on the left side of the painting. There are a few Roman soldiers there. Mm -hmm. uh, but if an uh, enemy uh, army during the battles uh, got a hold of one of those, uh, the, the Roman legions would attack those individuals until they got those things back um, in their hands. It was that important a symbol of, of so I think there's some government things that were going on. Uh, you would never see a Roman guy with a bare chest like that um, amongst their soldiers. That's, they, they were always properly uh, in uniform. Okay. So I think there's a, mis a, a mixture of uh, Jewish people uh, that are around there or inhabitants. They might be wealthy you know, members of uh, his, his court uh, but it also uh, kind of pushes off the side that a lot of the damage that was done to Christ was done by Roman soldiers when they were actually, I think, part of the Jewish um, soldiers um, uh, that were, um, that administered, I think, the conflagration. I don't believe it was only Roman soldiers. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think we we are again. Our time is up. We filled the, the hour, and I would leave like to leave you with the question: Can I maintain steadfastness in my faith against the pressure of the crowd? And thank you for coming again. Thank you very much. <laughs>